Council have been invited to participate in the seminar exploring the topic of contextualizing the self, making and remaking the first person in various religious traditions and from diverse methodological perspectives. The specific task set before me was to lecture on this theme as it pertains to the construction of the divine self in Kabbalistic teaching. Needless to say, this is a vast topic about which hundreds of pages have been written. In this lecture, I can only offer a modest attempt to share some of my own thoughts that have evolved in the span of almost four decades. Methodologically, I approach the question as a philosopher, not as an intellectual historian. However, as is always the case in my scholarship, the philosophical perspective is informed by historical context. We pick up our story in the 12th and 13th centuries when Kabbalah began to emerge as a clearly identifiable phenomenon in Provence in northern Spain. Bracketing the conviction uniformly expressed by adepts and even by some scholars that the esoteric teachings were transmitted either orally or partially writing for centuries before being transcribed more fully in written texts a process referred to recently in a somewhat confusing way as the repressive desublimation of rabbinic esotericism. The late Middle Ages is still the time that we can legitimately identify as the advent of Kabbalah on the stage of history. The rabbinic elite of this period, and it should be emphasized that Kabbalists either were members of that socioeconomic class or were in close proximity to the academies and synagogues imbued with its ideology. At this period, the rabbinic elite increasingly accepted the portrayal of God as unknowable and ineffable, a description, a description heavily influenced by the apophaticism embraced, um, embraced by medieval Jewish philosophers, the most prominent of them being Moses Maimonides. But at odds with the cataphatic emphasis of the scriptural and rabbinical Torah. Can, can we just explain what the apophatic and cataphatic? So, yeah. uh, we, we yes, okay. uh, these are technical terms from Greek uh, philosophy, which come to mean the apoph uh, sorry, the cataphatic, cataphasis, as positive attribution or the description of positive characteristics. So God is wise, God is good, um, God is true, God is just. Apophatic or apophas is, is the negative. It's literally speaking away. So it's uh, the argument, it, it's, it's the premise that we cannot speak positively about the nature of the divine, so that anything we say has to be at best understood as the denial of a negation. Good? Okay. So, uh, as I was saying, by, by the time the Kabbalah emerged, the rabbinic elite more or less uh, has accepted the view that the God of, of Judaism, even though the biblical and rabbinical Torah would suggest differently, is a God that is unknowable and inevitable. Um, as Maimonides explicitly argues in The Guide of the Perplexed, the ultimate apprehension of God consists of apprehending that we cannot apprehend God. Insofar as this, this supreme metaphysical, what he would have considered the supreme metaphysical knowledge, um, is the lack of knowledge. It follows that the most appropriate form of prayer, as he says quite explicitly, is silence, quoting song. And what he calls towards the end of the guide, the intellectual worship of the heart. Since any imagistic depiction of what is inherently without image, even if it is only verbal, is susceptible of alighting into idolatry. Indeed, even uttering praise of the inability to praise God may run the risk of affirming too much about the being from whom all perceptible and intelligible properties are to be expunged. Now, the roots for this negative theology 
uh, are in Platonism and especially in the Neoplatonic schools of late antiquity. But since some of the works that arose from there were translated and transmitted in the name of Aristotle, the best known example is the so-called Theology of Aristotle, which is, uh, consists of selections from Plotinus's Aeneas. It is fair to say that the Aristotelianism cultivated by medieval Jewish, Christian, and Muslim thinkers, at least until the 13th century, um, was tainted by Neoplatonism. Now, for our purposes, the most significant ramification of this intellectual hybridity, this uh, putting together Aristotelianism and Neoplatonism, was this fusion that, of the apophasis and cataphasis in the way that God is demarcated, or as God is typically called in philosophical literature, the first cause, or in Maimonides' term based on Ibn Sina, the Mechuyaha Mitsuya, the necessary existence, referred to as the hyper-being, or, or the being that is beyond being the being that transcends all predication. Um, and so the technical Greek term that's uh, at play here is hyperousias, which was coined by the pseudo -Pseudo And in that expression, hyperousias, the prefix hyper, connotes both the being that is beyond and therefore conceptually indescribable, and the being that is above, and therefore <coughs> metaphysically superlative. The logic of apophasis at, at, at its extreme leads to the proposition that nothing that is asserted about God can be taken as literally true. And if we stretch this to its limit, we cannot even ascribe existence to this being to which neither being nor non-being can be properly attributed. And we find that some of the Kabbalists at the end of the 13th century actually do use the expression lo yesh lo ayin in order to refer to either Keter or to Ein lo yesh lo ayin. But to probe, to probe the nature of the divine society, <coughs> Kabbalistic theosophy, we must begin with an appreciation of the central role according to the apophatic. The climax of the contemplative ascent, to use the idiom attributed to the Provencal Kabbalist Isaac of Lyme, con consists of thoughts cleaving to that which thought cannot comprehend. The expression Makshavahas Beka is used by his disciples to refer to this, to the Aliyata Makshava, the Deput of the Makshava, to the Mashava Makshava in the Masayat. The thought pleads to that which thought cannot comprehend. A state of the Deput facilitated by the mind divesting itself of all concepts, images, and words. Some Kabbalists even went so far as to identify the goal of the mystical path as, as they could things, as conjunction with the infinite. In this non-dual consciousness, or if you will, meta-consciousness, the consciousness that is beyond consciousness, all differentiation is overcome, and the suitability of language is called into question. As we find in the case of visionaries in other religious communities, influenced by this apophasis or this via negativa, the Apophasis voiced by countless engenders what could be simply called a, myth, a mystical atheism that renders all theistic portrayals of God, including the theosophy promulgated by the Kabbalists themselves, as conceptual idolatry. This would lend credence to Franz Rosenzweig's comment in The Star of Redemption that the fundamental idea of negative theology culminates with atheism. And it culminates with atheism and mysticism shaking hands. Or as Derrida put it, and I quote, like a certain mysticism, apophatic discourse has always been suspected of atheism. Elsewhere, Der Derrida states that the atheistic quality of Jewish esotericism relates more specifically to the indeterminacy of meaning, a hallmark of this deconstructionist hermeneutics. 
but it also signals the subversion of monotheism insofar as the personal descriptions of God are reduced to images that are factually false. Now, to be sure, uh, in Kabbalistic sources, the apophatic dimension is counterbalanced by an amplification of the cataphatic predication of the biblical rabbinic corpora. With respect to this matter, there is a core between Kabbalah and the mystical piety fostered by Christians and Muslims. In all three monotheistic faiths, informed by their respective scriptural legacies, the language germane to the visionary gnosis of the divine ensues from the juxtaposition of the cataphatic and the ap apophatic. That is to say, the very being to whom the disparate forms are ascribed is the being from whom those forms are erased. The mystical utterance, consequently, is a gesture of speaking not, rather than not speaking. An unsaying of the said is the saying of the unsaid. Once we can deduce that there is no end to speaking when what is spoken is the unspeakable. That's why you find God is right. More and more and more and more. They don't, they don't adopt vows of silence, either with respect to speaking or writing. Now, Fila Tanita Dibur, even the Tanita Dibur, which of course is a technical rabbinic category, even the Tanita Dibur requires certain tefillot, or the utterance of tehillim. So we don't have a model of complete uh, withdrawal from verbal uh, articulation. Um, okay, then I'll skip a little bit here. Um, Again, to come back to my point that I, I was making before, if, we, if one follows the logic of this Derek Shlila, of the Via Negativa, to its limit, one is led to the unsettling realization that monotheism is in truth, or at least in its mystical truth, atheism. Or, alternatively expressed, the aniconic corollary of the monotheistic creed occasions the undoing and demythologization of theism. Now, to bring it back specifically to Kabbalistic uh, symbolism. Assuming that Ein Sof is beyond all description, then any positive statement of belief <coughs> would be an apophatic gesture of unbelief. Indeed, in some sense, the crumbling of the, corn of the cornerstone of monotheism. Since one would have to believe in the representation of God that one could not believe in on the grounds that they are illusory appearances of what is, in fact, inapparent, or that which cannot appear, that which cannot be manifest, that which is concealment as such. Now, the atheistic tendency to go beyond the portrayal of the divine, develops from and remains dialectically intertwined with its the theistic underpinning. So the unraveling of, of, of the latter necessarily brings about the nullification of the former. Or if I wanted to use Meister Eckhart's celebrated formula, to free God from God, requires that the Godhead beyond God, that is ain't self, be liberated from any delimitation of godly wisdom that is not subject to an uncompromising and seemingly never-ending denegation. <coughs> the hermeneutical post postulate underlying this claim is that to overcome is not to deny or to destroy, but to surpass, which entails constant delineation of the limit that one perpetually exceeds. The surpassing invariably secures the threshold that has been surpassed. Maybe one of the most succinct formulations of what I'm getting at it was offered by uh, a Kabbalist who was active at the end of the 13th century, beginning of the 14th century, Yitzhak de Minakov, who reports in his mystical diary, the Otsar Chaim, that he received from his master, who goes unnamed, that the goal of contemplation is to uh, which is stated that they could with the ain't so, um, which he says is beyond name, the nameless. Um, but the only way to achieve that is Alder Hasulam Shiv Hashem Amaforash. 
the only way to achieve the day quickly with the end so that if the nameless is through the name which is the latter. Um, so here I think we come face to face with the paradox um, that informs the Kabbalistic world here. The namelessness of the infinite, whose hidden truth is beyond comprehension and verbalization, can be revealed only by constricting its luminal darkness in the spiritual light of the four letters of the ineffable name, the Shema Mufarash, also called the Shema Efen, the essential name, since it comprises the essence of Ainsdorf, but an essence that is essentially without essence. It's an essence that is the absence of essence. So uh, let me briefly recall here a discussion of Sholem, uh, which will uh, cast some of my own insights into sharper relief. So in, in his study, Shir Koma, the mystical shape of the Godhead, Sholem noted that, quote, the crucial for the metaphysics of the Kabbalah is the belief that, quote, the formless substance of Ein Sof is immediately present in its full reality in all stages of emanation and creation. Whence it follows that, quote, there is no thoroughly shaped image that can completely detach itself from the depths of the formless. What Shalom is getting at here is that so the, the, the imminence of the formless in every form yield the fundamental paradox. And, and this is how Shalom enunciates that paradox. The truer the form, the more, fa more powerful the life of the formless within it. To delve into the abyss of formlessness is no less absurd an undertaking for the Kabbalist than to ascend to the form itself. The mystical nihilism that destroys any shape dwells hand in hand with the prudent, prudent moderation struggling to comprehend that shape. Um, the, the attentive ear will discern in these words what is a basic tenet in Sholem's approach to mysticism, and that is that the mystical experience is an encounter with, an ab with the absolute or infinite what he refers to here as the shapeless abyss. And thus, to the extent that the formlessness threatens to undermine the forms imparted by the text and reified by the rituals of a particular tradition, the experience is potentially nihilistic. Now here, here I would depart a little bit with Shalom with regard to the language of nihilism. Um, I would look at this from a slightly different perspective, but I, but I do agree with Sholem that there is this paradoxical, or what he would more typically refer to as a kind of dialectical intertwining of formlessness and form. And again, as I said before, to me, this is a characteristic that is not unique to the Kabbalists, but is shared also by Christian and Muslim mystics in the Middle Ages, in the European continent, in large measure due to the influence of that Neoplatonic legacy. And this uh, addition I will add um, from, from the point of view of uh, hermeneutical point of view, it relates also to another paradox which has been central to my thinking, and which also uh, echoes uh, an insight of Sholem, and that concerns the um, inability to separate concealment and disclosure. Right. And the 16th century Kabbalist in Sultan Sfat uh, formulated this as a principle, you find it in Alshir and in, in Vital, Cordovero, also one text that's attributed to the Ari, and that is Ahelem Sibat HaGivoy, HaGivoy Sibat HaHelem. So that the concealment is the cause of disclosure and disclosure is the cause of concealment, which essentially means you cannot really separate those two. Um, but there is some kind of paradoxical identity of these opposites. Okay, so I'm gonna skip uh, I'm gonna skip here a discussion about Walter Benjamin, which I think is interesting, but maybe uh, I have a little Rahmanut. <laughs> 
<laughs> not forget that. Uh, but it is interesting, and it's important to actually understand Shalom and his reading just, of Torah. Just uh, explain more than you think needs explanation. Yeah. Well, then we'll be here beyond my flight at that time. <laughs> so I, yeah, I, uh, maybe with an in-depth circulator paper. Um, all right, I'll try to do my best to, uh, to get the simplified as much as I can. Okay, so I'm going to skip this whole discussion with Danny, which I said is interesting, but um, I will skip it. Um, so let me get, let me go um, pick it up again at this point. Um, the, coupled with this, coupled with this insight regarding the formlessness or the namelessness of the Ain Self, whose light is manifest in the form of the ten sphere, of, or collectively of the Shem Farah. Right? Um, there is also the very strong emphasis in the Kabbalistic literature on the contemplative task of visualizing the invisible through the image of the human form. And according to <coughs> a recurrent exegesis in Kabbalistic literature, Adam is linked philologically to the expression at Amel El Yom in Isaiah 14, 14, which read Kabbalistically means that there is a theosophic grounding to the priestly notion that the human being bears the likeness and image of the divine. So in contrast to the, the scriptural derivation of Adam itself from the term Adama, which obviously relates to our transient and earthly character. This mystical word, wordplay places superiority on the human species, and this is limited more uh, prototypically in the people of Israel, in the fact that the human shape iconically mirrors the body of God. So all of this is going on at the same time that the Catholics are accepting that the Ain Self is beyond all representation. Okay, so this positive val this positive uh, characterization of Adam having been created in God's image and somehow related to the physical nature of Adam and not simply the psychic or the spiritual, this is predicated on the presumption of some kind of correspondence between the limbs of the human body and what they thought of as the limbs of the divine body, or the sphero, spherotic emanations. Another verse that is typically cited by the Kabbalists to support this correspondence is from Job, Mitasari Echazeh Aloha, which they read very literally, I would even say hyper-literally, that is from the body, from the bodily flesh, one can visualize, one can envision, one can see the contours of the divine body. Um, now, of course it goes without saying that no Kabbalist, at least none with whom I am familiar, uh, presuming that the divine body should be understood literally as if God were a fleshly being subject to generation and corruption birth and death. But it is also clear that no Kabbalist could accept the philosophical view that these expressions are merely allegorical. So the ascription of a body to God is not simply a rhetorical device to express the inherent metaphoricity of theological language. And here too I would say that Scholem rightly noted that the medieval theology dictated by philosophers 
quote, sought to push the biblical concept of monotheism to its utmost extreme, and even outdid the Bible itself in removing any vestiges therein of mythical or anthropomorphic, or anthropomorphic parlance. In the newly evolving Kabbalah, we find the opposite tendency. Here, too, the spiritualization of the idea of God is accepted, fact, but the ancient images reemerged, albeit now with symbolic char character. And it goes on to say, unlike the philosophers, the Kabbalists were not ashamed of these images. On the contrary, they saw in them the repositories of divine mysteries. So, uh, here too, I, I walked in the footsteps of Sholem, but I would I would uh, say that I have a slightly different perspective than Sholem, in that I tried to provide a model that walk, goes between the literal and the allegorical or the figurative, and that's what I refer to in my work as the imaginal body. So I think of the the body of the divine as the imaginal body, not the imaginative body, but the imaginal body, which is a term that I borrow from the work of Henri Corbin uh, on Islamic esotericism. In order to convey this sense of embodiment that is not material flesh, but is nevertheless uh, a concrete phenomenon and not merely a figure of speech. Anyhow, again, I'm, 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 I'm going to uh, I'm going to here uh, I'm short my short my presentation here because uh, I have a feeling that it's maybe a little bit too difficult to follow me, and maybe with Adam's response, he'll open up things, and, and, and then I'll have a chance to elaborate on some of my ideas here. Uh, but I would say to the the main point that I'm trying to get at here is. I, the divine self assumes a corporeal form in the imagination of the visionary. But of course, the interesting thing is that the visionary who can imagine the divine body is someone who has achieved through, through ascetic practices a, div a, div a divesting of corporeality. Um, And we have then the tension in the literature between the apophatic tendency with its emphasis on the unknowable formlessness and then the, the more cataphatic tendency related to the visionary or contempt, contemplative necessity to, to form an image of the divine in the imagination that is itself been divested of corporeality. So this notion of the imaginal body suggests that the Kabbalists in a rather sophisticated way for their time, for the historical <coughs> time, and I think this has stood out across the generations, have offered us a very uh, unusual idea of embodiment. Right? So that even our embodiment, our mortal flesh is transformed by this Kabbalistic notion that the true nature of embodiment is connected to letter. And more specifically, of course, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which are all thought to be comprised within the Shema and the Farash. So that the ultimate <coughs> signifier of embodiment for the Kabbalist uh, is the name, the name of the nameless. Um, and just as um, just as the name is the ladder by which one ascends to and is integrated within the nameless, right, so the uh, conjuring of the form of the divine in the imagination is the means by which one ascends to contempt contemplatively and is ultimately incorporated into the formless. So I would say, coming towards, uh, mercifully coming towards the end, um, that the Kabbalistic um, approach confirms what I would call the final 
gesture of iconoclasm in, in, in Jewish monotheism because it calls for the destroy, destroying the idol of the very God personified as the deity that must be worshipped without being uh, idolized. Now let me, let me, uh, let me uh, support this idea by mentioning Rav Kook. Um, in accord with, with the Rambam, Rav Kook was sensitive to the fact that the theistic renderings of God are idolatrous. The way we pray to God, the way we imagine God, typically, Rav Kook says without any hesitation, are in fact idolatrous. As he puts it in one, part, in one passage, he says that the, the ikar ha'emunah, the essence of faith, is the gedulat shleimut ensof. That's the ultimate measure of emunah, gedulat shleimut ensof. And thus, whatever we imagine in our hearts about God, he says, is a glimmer that must be completely obliterated when viewed against what really exists, which is the Orain self, the light of the self. And he goes on to say that every name we assign to the Ain self is, quote, but a small and dim spark from the hidden light to which the soul aspires when it utters the word Elohim. Every de definition of divinity brings about kefirah, Say that again. Every de definition of divinity brings about fira. Every definition is yut ruchanim, which I translate here as spiritual idolatry. Even the attribution of the intellect and the will, and even divinity, the Elohut itself, for Elohim is a definition. All, what Rav Koko is saying here is all positive God talk. By the way, this is retrievable from the Shmona Kvatsin, where we finally hear, heard the, you know, the words of Rav Kuk without the editorial hand of the Nazir or Tzvi Yudakot. So this is, this is a very strong, there are other passages like this here that I would I can't share them all here because it was an election of Cook, but I, I think I chose the good one. Because, the, you know, there's, there's no ambiguity. All positive God <coughs> engenders kfira. But at the deepest level, the kfira is the unfaith for of Cook that is indistinguishable from faith. And now let me, let me say these words again. With regard to the supernal divine truth, there is no difference at all between the conceived belief and heresy. Heresy, too, is the disclosure of the force of life, for the light of life of the supernal splendor is garbed within it. Okay, so the way I'm understanding of Cook here is that the, the, the theistic representation are, he acknowledges, explanations that bring us to the source of faith. But these explanations can have the opposite effect of diminishing one's spirituality, spiritual vitality. In fact, it goes on to say that the Maxor the, Gado, the greatest impediment of the human spirit, is achieved, is achieved, is to achieve maturity such that but let me say it again. The greatest impediment of the human spirit to achieving maturity is that the machshava elohit becomes fixed as a particular form. But the ascendancy of atheism in, in, in time that precedes the messianic emancipation, according to Ralph Cook, is viewed as a constructive light. Uh, as the repudiation of the belief that is necessary, quote, to eliminate the dross that has clung to the faith because of the dearth of knowledge that is worship. So I think you got the point. That the, the function of atheism for Rav Cook is to remove these pseudo tamyukhado from our conception of, of divinity and to uproot, uproot the, the, the klipa, 
that separates the human from the true from the divine life. And then he says that that must be destroyed consists of the Yachas Hamitziyut the Chalut El Elohim. What does that mean? Is everything I've been trying to say. <laughs> to get to the point where scorns on self, huh? Scorns on self. To get to the point that even to say of this ain't self that it exists is too too tzam. It's too too tzam. So to get beyond tzimtzum, effectively, to get to the state of harchava or in pashtut, expansiveness of consciousness that would go beyond even referring to the existence of God. Okay, so uh, um, maybe I'll end here. But so just to some, to bring it into some kind of closure. So what I was trying to get at here is that what Rav Kook articulates in the 20th century is the culmination, and I think by the way greatly influenced by Chabad, but it is a culmination of thinking that began in earnest in the 13th century with the Nukubalian. And it's a path that you know, was uh, clearly discernible where it would go. But it is to get us to a point where, <coughs> where the very activity of personifying the divine is to lead us to what I've called the deep personification, to get us beyond. And that has a corresponding, I think Adam is going to elaborate on this, this would have a corresponding psychological dimension, which would be the divesting of our own ego self, which would correspond to this process. Okay. okay, I think this, uh, thank you, Elliot. Uh, this raises uh, a lot of questions. Uh, among other things, uh, do we? I mean, what what Elliot focused on was both the the, the not the impersonal aspects of God, whereas in fact, in, in many ways, God. Once you you go beyond a soft, once you go beyond the pure essence of God, which is indeed Apophati, cannot be understood, cannot be said, cannot be uttered. Uh, then God has, in fact, a person. He has more than one person. In fact, he has ten persons. The, the Sephirot have their own characteristics, their own histories, their own sexualities, their own gender. All of these things, I think, we would like to ask you and, uh, and, and hear from, from you uh, about, uh, as in some ways, I think, it, this, this, this characterizes what is special about Judaism, because the apophatic aspects, in fact, are Palestinian, are Christian, are Muslim, I mean, that that aspect, I think, and including the including the most the most daring uh, statements that you like, like Cooks, uh, you can find in other places. Whereas Sfirat Kete or Sfirat Malchut, that you cannot find at least not one to one in other places. Or at least we, we can talk about this. Our respondent is uh, uh, Professor Adam Afterman. Professor Adam Afterman is a uh, chair of the Department of uh, uh, Jewish Philosophy and uh, and stood up. So we just heard a very rich uh, presentation. I'll be focusing in my written uh, response on uh, some aspects, and then we can probably talk about other aspects later on when we open up the discussion. So I'm extremely grateful to Professor Abiyad Kleinberg for inviting me to respond to Professor Wolfson's presentation. It is a welcome opportunity and an appropriate occasion to express once again my deep admiration of Elliot and his scholarship. This workshop was a great platform for me personally to delve once again into some of his recent thought and work. In the weeks leading to this workshop, I had the opportunity to reread some of Elliot's main studies regarding the self and God. However, due to the time restrictions, I'll be primarily re referencing his paper that we just heard today. What I'd like to focus here is, after such an eloquent presentation, is into the, the overlap of Eliot's methods and conclusions regarding the divine non-persona, and my and actually his long-established interest in the matters of religious transformation, integrative mysticism, bikut and mystical union from the perspective of the human self. 
uh, he engaged this topic both in a deep and articulate manner, and I would like to highlight his very interesting understanding of the Godhead and the divine self, and the ultimate mystical fusion between it and the human self in the movement of Unia Mystica. Before I delve into the question of what exactly happens or does not happen in the moment of fusion of the human self and the Godhead, uh, I would like to pause and consider the stages leading to Elliot's presentation of the Divine Self. And I'll just go over a few of the basic stages I think we heard today. Then, with these stages in mind, I'll advance toward a possible understanding of the human self, and ultimately ask what kind of mystical integration is it possible between the two. As we just heard, in Kabbalistic literature following uh, Sefer Tirah, one finds a hyper-linguistic conception of reality in which all being, including the human uh, being, and even, we just heard, the human body, is a linguistic manifestation of the divine name, whose essence is the concealed Godhead. Consequently, there is a fundamental ontological connection, or an organic isomorphic extension that exists between the human individual and the Godhead. As previously mentioned, the impact of Neoplatonic Via Negativa of Maimonides and other philosophers impact the way the Kabbalists portrayed God. In this philosophical strand, they imagined God as unknowable and infallible. This tendency was interwined, as we just heard, with the conflicting biblical and rabbinic positive emphasis on figural representation of God and ultimately the fundamental assumption that God is to be related to as a persona, as a name, in some sort of intimacy. Transcending his wisdom, his light, and private name lies the dark light, what Elliot just uh, referred to as the luminal darkness, that is somehow at the same time the root of God's light and the human candle, the human self. Before going into the complicated question of how Wolfson views the Godhead and the divine self, we just heard the uh, uh, presentation, I would like to first refer to Sholem to better understand the two basic ways of understanding the Godhead in the scholarship of Kabbalah up until Eliot, and their implications for the understanding of the human self of mystical transformation. Eliot himself, in a very important uh, essay, Annihilating Non-Ground on the Temporal Sway of Becoming, cites himself Sholem's true understanding of the Godhead in his Ten on Historical Acronisms on Kabbalah. This is a classic uh, text on this topic, which he identified in Zoharic literature and Luriani Kabbalah. There's two ways to view this problem. Regarding the former, Sholem wrote, one might well ascribe the early Kabbalists' pantheistic identification of Ensof and nothingness to their own real experience. The mystic who treats his experience undialectically must end up in pantheism. And uh, for Sholem, we know pantheism is a very negative uh, attribute or conception. We um, remember Yosef and Shlomo, they wrote about the fear or the fear of pantheism. That's something that's haunting the scholarship of Jewish mysticism from, uh, from the beginning. Does that explain what pantheism is? Pantheism in this context is uh, ultimately the theory that God in existence or every, all reality is one. And human and God is one. And there's no small difference or some kind of categorical difference between God as a creator and the universe. And Sholem, following Ayaman Cohen and other thinkers, uh, viewed that as an atheistic understanding of, uh, of God. He felt that the, the Kabbalists were always, that was a kind of categorical borderline of heresy that they couldn't pass. They were like on the border of that all the time and always keeping them, at least when they're talking and expressing their experiences, they always are very careful not to express and go all the way to pantheistic uh, theories. So he said, if you identify Ein and then Sof, ultimately reach an untheistic understanding of uh, the Godhead. And Eliot just uh, talked about that from one uh, aspect. Here, Shalom concludes that the identification of Ensof of Ayn, rooted in mystical experience, and here we're coming into the, what, the psychological, the personal aspect. People experience this. It's not only a theological move ultimately leads to a form of pantheism in which no distinction can be made between the divine and creation. 
Uh, and that's an extremely anti-theistic notion in his view. We should bear in mind that this pantheism is exactly what allows for mystical fusion of unia mystica to take place. Thus, pantheism and unia mystica for Sholem exist beyond the parameters of uh, theistic Judaism. We know he was against both pantheism and against unia mystica. This is already, uh, we already, I think, in the Jewish scholarship of Jewish mysticism, already overcome a lot of this uh, in recent years. And my book is also about that. Regarding the later conception, Scholler writes that Luria's conception of Tinsu allows for a distinction to be made between the Godhead and nothingness, thereby placing the Ensof on a separate ontological plane. Thus, Luria Arik, eh, writes that he guards against the danger of dissolution into the non individual being of the divine all in all. In Scholler's eyes, the language of Bekut and not union. Uh, reflects exactly this tension, a form of mystical integration that does not lead one to full annihilation into the Godhead. It doesn't bring it to full bitul into the end soul. That's safeguarding God's transcendence and avoiding pantheism. So these are the two options by Shola. Now we're going to say a word about the third alternative discourse. And he offers an alternative discord regarding the nothingness of the infinite. He does not, this is, I hope I understand it right. Uh, Wilson does not agree with Sean's assertion that the options are either an holistic pantheism, in which the Godhead is identified as being, or a theistic mysticism in which the Godhead is, un is understood as a transcendent being beyond being. Wilson's third way of viewing the Godhead one in which the Godhead is conceived as beyond being, similar to Luria's description, but at the same time as a form of nothingness, as found in Sholem's analysis of the Zoric conception. So this may be, uh, best be uh, articulated actually in uh, a quote that I'll just quote from Meredith's paper. We heard something of this before. The nothingness of infinity to which the Kabbalists allude is not a substance subject to the antinomy of existence and non-existence, but rather the dynamic event, and this is very important, it's an event, of the imminent transcendence, that is the transcendent imminence, that is the event wherein transcendence and imminence are juxtaposed in the sameness of their difference, prior to the division into transcendence and imminence, dictated by the logic of traditional ontotheology. Okay, that's, he wrote that, and uh, you know, he just he explained that in different words just earlier, this point where, where, you know, this nothingness is something that's beyond the categories of regular uh, existence and non-existence. Therefore, I think the big chidush of Eliot is that he proposed that Ensof is outside the structure altogether of negative theology. As he said, as he said, God or the Ensof is an absolute that does not signify an unknowable one, but rather the main fault, that is the plurmonic bias or nothingness as being's core. The negation devoid of the negation of its negation, or a triple ne negativity, the emptiness of the fullness, that is the fullness of emptiness, emptied of the emptiness of its emptiness. Now, I know this sounds a bit, uh, uh, I think, but that was, that we're trying to express in words, or I think uh, Eliot is trying to express in words, in a poetic uh, way, perhaps, uh, this, this form of, uh, of uh, ensof that's beyond uh, ein and gesh, some kind of category that's beyond, and I think, it, you know, once you get used to this kind of uh, uh, discourse, it actually makes sense. <laughs> I can, uh, I can, <laughs> I can, <laughs> Uh, in this conception, to speak of the Godhead as something is just as mistaken as to speak of it as nothing. For it is both because it's neither. It's neither the Godhead itself, the Ensof itself, is neither something or nothing. It's something that uh, transcends that. Okay? Um, like I mentioned in his paper, Elliot mainly focused on the divine self, and he was, in, you know, invited to talk about the divine self. And I'm going to move and say a few words about the implications for the conception of the human self, and uh, 
the human psychological and mystical transformation that's linked to this. Since man is ontologically connected in different ways to the Godhead, mystical transformation and integration, including mystical union, are forms of realization of a pre-existent unity. I mentioned that the human self should be conceived as a linguistic manifestation of the divine name, and as such, the movement towards the divine may be considered as a form of realization or embodiment of the tetragrammaton in the human, that of becoming one with the name, or the divine light and wisdom that are considered embodied inside the name. And we just heard different uh, articulations of this dynamics, but now we're talking about the human dynamics. The human is also, like you said about Adam, the human is, is structured out of the divine name, and the same process is parallel inside the human. This uh, movement of realization of the human inside the name is a movement of bitur, of iyun bivri, yeah, iyun bitur. But the person has to get rid of uh, the false self, that that would be the ego or some other form of a name, a false name, and realize his true name. The true name, the true self, is God's self. And then we reach a very complicated moment where realizing your true self in God is re reaching this point where God's self is at the same time uh, a name, and what transcends that name. Okay, and I'll say a few words about that now. Uh, about this movement. So the first uh, move would be, uh, like I said, the realization or the embodiment of the divine name in the human, that becoming one of the name. This is a positive type of unimistica. The human realizing its core being is shared or is one with the divine being. However, since the divine name, whose essence, or in fact in essence, is the concealed Godhead, Man's being is also to be understood as beyond being and non-being and as con non-substantial with the God in himself because God himself is beyond his being, beyond his name, so becoming one of God is a parallel move beyond. Here referring to a unit that occurs beyond the name, light, or intellect of both the human and divine agents. And uh, we just heard before that some Kabbalists uh, identify the goal of the mystical path as conjunctions vikut with the infinite. However, like I said, the question is how one should understand mystical transformation in such a setting. If both the Godhead and the human self are ultimately nothingness, or this form of nothingness beyond nothingness, how does mystical transformation, a mystical union, take uh, part, or how does it actually happen in, uh, in, this, uh, in history? The movement from yesh to ayin, and from ayin to ensof, whereupon the yesh is understood as the same other, or the original repetition of that which has already been. And this is where <coughs> some of, uh, I think, Heidegger's uh, thought is coming into Wolfson's uh, analysis. In this consciousness, the yesh is considered as the ultimate revelation, the name of the ultimate concealment. However, due to the nature of this concealment, what is disclosed is the concealment, for the concealment cannot be disclosed as concealment unless it's concealed. And this is this paradox that uh, Elia just talked about of uh, Elem and Gilui. Since the, this conception of the Godhead is a uh, meontological in nature, meaning that it's infinite there's an infinite kind of chasm, or chaluka, in which opposites converge at the point of their origin. This mystical transformation of coming towards the ultimate union does not only affect the soul, but even the body as well. We just heard about uh, this theory from Eliot. The somatic body is transformed into a semiotic one, into a permutation of the name. The material becomes textual. And ultimately, man becomes one with the divine name. As uh, Wolfson, Wolfson said, uh, just uh, stated, so I'm not going to quote that now. For this understanding, in the void of the infinite, the material is the spiritual, and the spiritual is the material. And the ultimate goal of the mystical goal 
is to cleave to the nameless. The only way to achieve that end, however, is through the union or the realization of the union as a name, which is a ladder. We just heard about the name in the Sulam. However, as Wolfson continued, one can never dispose of the ladder because the name is not only the means by which one ascends to the nameless, it is the, uh, it's the adventure by which the nameless is declaimed and thereby, thereby remains inexpressible. Okay, so this name has to stay there and you can't, you can't go beyond the name. You have to have the name all the time, uh, at the same time with the nameless. So I'm just going to complete with one uh, more remark about what happens, and I hope uh, Elliot could be generous enough to talk about that a bit more in the public, about how he understands this moment of uh, fusion itself, of the, of, the, of the self, the human self, Ani, with this uh, form of uh, Godhead. Okay? Uh, we see, I would like to suggest, and uh, here I'm very careful that the moment of mystical union with the absolute nothingness, which is more than nothing, and therefore less than nothing, is to transcend the binary model of union and communion, or this distinction between the name and nothingness, in which one's essence, that means the human essence, and here we, we're, not, we're not talking about a union that erases not the humans, but also not the name of God. So this is, we're talking about a very uh, complicated moment, or movement, or event. I think that's the word to use, event, in which God is united inside himself, and then God, and then the human is participating in the same kind of dynamics in this event where he's at the same time transcendent, and at the same time embodied, or same time uh, embodied in the name, embodied in the in the body. We're at this at this point, the body you uh, kind of hinted to that the body is not the regular body; it's the name. So the human becomes the name, and the name at the same time is fused with the and so. So we're talking about a, a very interesting event where they're both uh, kind of uh, in this final state not as a singular moment of final illumination, but rather as a perpetual de uh, dynamic that is a fully, it's never fully realized. This is a, this is a movement, and we're, we're used to Eastern kind of categories of thought where union brings us to a moment of absolute illumination, absolute, uh, you know, final, absolute integration. This is an event that uh, continues for the moment it is realized, it begins again. The running and returning of Atsova Shov, and that's the image I think best used to talk about this dynamics, this event. Atsova Shov, which is itself the event of union, is a union beyond union. So that's, uh, I just wanted to kind of bring that to a more uh, uh, hinted kind of a point about the mystical union. I hope uh, Elliot will be willing to say a few more words about that uh, in our discussion. Thank you very much.